Well, hello. Uh, welcome to our continuing look at the Bible, and specifically today, 1 Samuel. Just some thoughts that I had during my daily Bible reading. And uh, again, not a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, just some thoughts I had that the Lord impressed upon me as I was reading through the Scriptures today. So I'm just sharing these with you to uh, uh, encourage you a bit. And uh, if you have any comments, please make them. If you've got questions, please ask. If you've got disagreements, state them. Let's talk about it. I can always learn because I'm certainly not, uh, I don't have a complete understanding of Scripture. There's more about the Bible I don't know than what I do know. So I'm always welcome to hearing your suggestions. Looking at uh, 1 Samuel 14, and uh, actually we're going to move on past that to... Uh, 1 Samuel 15, and that is Saul hasn't been king very long, only for a few pages, although probably he's been king for quite a while. Uh, I'll get to that later, but when David was with Goliath and had the battle with Goliath, uh, we, we can do the math and see that Saul was probably, uh, if David was 15 years old, I should get to this later, but I'll go ahead and do it now. If David was 15 years old when he fought Goliath, fast forward 15 years, David is king of Israel, which means Saul, who reigned for 40 years, would have been in the 25th year of his reign. Those are ballpark figures. David may have been 20 when he fought Goliath. If so, then Saul is even older. But uh, Saul is not... Uh, not doing very well right now, especially before the Lord. And uh, he keeps doing stupid things and selfish things and, and whatever. And in uh, chapter 15 and verse 10, it's a very sad verse. The word of the Lord came to Samuel and said, this is the Lord speaking to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king for he's turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel was not, he didn't say, yeah, you're right, Lord, we got to get rid of him. He was weeping because I think in some ways Samuel had been mentoring Saul, but Saul just wasn't getting it. Uh, one thing that happened here, uh, it said that, Saul went to war against the Amalekites and the Lord told him completely wipe out all these people, kill off all the animals, kill off all the people. And we can talk about, gee, that's genocide. That's bad to do. Number one, if God says to do it, he's right. Uh, I've heard some things about the Amalekites, how evil they were and how filled with disease they were and how filled with disease their animals were. And, and God was saying, we've got to get rid of this. But also remember the, the spiritual application for us today is not that we are to kill off our enemies, but we are to be very careful not to embrace any of their characteristics. And so we're to keep ourselves holy before the Lord. But uh, here's the thing, Samuel comes up to Saul and says, you didn't kill off all the Amalekites. And Saul, number one, says, yeah, I did, yeah, I did. He lied, he said he did. And Samuel says, wait a minute, what's all this, this noise I hear? It's sheep, you know, bleeding and that sort of thing. And Saul said, oh, well, I'm, I've saved the best of the livestock to sacrifice to the Lord your God. He didn't say the Lord my God. He didn't say the Lord, the mighty God of Israel, the God who delivered us from the slavery of Egypt. I, he didn't say that. He tried to uh, kind of show, gain favor with Samuel by saying, I'm doing this for your God. See, I'm doing it for you. Then be be uh, appreciative of, of what I'm doing for you. you know? And Saul still wasn't impressed. And then Sam, uh, Saul, um, Samuel was not impressed. And then Saul said, well, the people made me do it. The people were putting pressure on me. And they didn't want to destroy everything. So it's almost like Adam in the Garden of Eden, blaming other people, refusing to take responsibility, lying. Um, and that was, that was it. 
And in verse 17, Samuel tells him, and I, I believe he probably had tears in his eyes as he's pouring out his heart in front of, Sam, in front of Saul. He says, is it not true, though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed you king over Israel. But now the Lord has taken it all from you and will give it to someone else. And uh, it goes on to explain here, this is a very powerful chapter. It's the famous verse, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. You know, don't talk about, I've got all these wonderful things I'll give you, God. God's not interested in our gifts. He's interested in our obedience, our devotion to him. And then it also says, rebellion is as the sin of divination, as witchcraft. If we are rebelling against God, it's like we have a spirit of witchcraft against us or, or in us. And so this is a very serious things that have happened in the life of Saul. And Samuel grieved over Saul. Again, I think that he may have been trying to have a mentoring relationship with this young man who, had, who was definitely disadvantaged in a lot of ways, emotionally and uh, immature, certainly spiritually deficient. He'd have highs and lows. And, but I think Samuel then saw, gee, this isn't going to work. And so the Lord told Samuel, go to Bethlehem where you will anoint the next king. So he goes, long story short, and he goes to the house of Jesse, led by the Lord. One of your sons is going to become the new king. And he tells Jesse, and I know Jesse was, oh boy, one of my boys made it. He'll be the next king. So call your boys in. And he did, sort of. And uh, there was the oldest brother was named Elab. E-L-I-A-B, Elab, I guess is how you pronounce it. Tall, strong, good looking, had a good bearing about him. Oh, and Samuel says, oh yeah, he's got to be the king. And he walks up and he gets ready to put his hands on him to anoint him as king. And the Lord says, forget it, not him. Not him. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature. Because I have rejected him. God sees not as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. And we're going to come back to Elab in a few minutes. So Samuel says, okay. So he goes to the second son. The Lord says, no, not him. Third son, no way. The, ne the next son, forget it. And he goes to all the boys. And he turns to Jesse and says, I'm really confused. The Lord said, one of your sons is going to be anointed as the next king. Are these all your boys? Have you got any more? And the other brothers are going, blah, 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 blah. There's, this, there's this one boy, David, and we don't like him. He's young and he's always smarter than we are and always uh, doing all these great things. And he's always succeeding, but we don't like him. He's out in the field tending the flock. And Samuel says, go call for him. I'll wait. Now, some people have thought, I've heard this, and nothing really contradicts this in the scripture, that David's father was Jesse, but he could have been the illegitimate son of a, a girlfriend that Jesse had somewhere along the way. So he was kind of hidden away all the time. He was kind of a, a, a disappointment, humiliation of Jesse. He really didn't want David to be known to anybody because of how he was conceived and born. But this is something that was really neat about David. David's out tending the flock, and he's working, right? And so they call, and somebody goes out, a messenger. Come in here, you're wanted, your dad wants you to see. Okay, so he leaves his flock in the care of someone. He just didn't leave well, all the sheep without, without a shepherd. He found somebody, said, watch over these guys, I'll be back as quick as I can. He goes in the house, Samuel says, hey, you know, the Lord's, speaks to him, this is the boy, this will be the next king of Israel, and Samuel anoints him, you will be the next king of Israel, and David says, what's that all about, I gotta get back to the sheep, okay, go back to work, boom, and he's going, what is that, he didn't say, oh boy, I'm the next king of Israel, I'm not gonna go work, no, he didn't do that, he was, he just took it all in stride, well, Lord, if this is what you want for me, that's fine, if not, that's fine, 
maybe he's just a crazy old man who's visiting my house and he wants to make an impression with me. I don't know what it is, but I'm going back to work. David kept his mind focused on the job at hand, the task he had to do right then and there. Now, one thing we're going to look at just briefly here, we have David is from the tribe of Judah. And remember I said earlier that there's a, uh, if you watch, there's a lot of connection and even competition between Judah and Joseph. Now, Saul was not of the tribe of Joseph. He was of the tribe of, of Benjamin, which is Joseph's brother. And the, the Joseph and Benjamin were the sons of Rachel. So it's still pretty close to the tribe of, of, um, of Joseph. Joseph and, and anyway, um, because, because now Judah and Benjamin, you know, again, have some, have some competition as well. So now we have Saul and David are the two kings. And we'll see what envelops here. We do know from Genesis 49, when Joseph, I mean, I'm sorry, when Jacob is giving his blessings to his sons, he said that the uh, tribe of Judah, the scepter will not be taken away from your hand. He was declaring, Jacob was declaring to Jacob. Jacob was declaring to Judah. I'll get it right in a minute. Too many J's. Jacob was declaring to Judah, your descendants will be the kings of Israel. And they were. Now, we're going to move now to chapter 17 and the famous David and Goliath. And I've got a few things to say about that. One is uh, David's brothers were in Saul's army. And when David comes to visit them, it's kind of the opposite of Joseph. He didn't go to tell on him. He told them he came to bring them supplies he wanted to report back to his dad how the battle was going, but he wasn't there to, to spy out his brothers. He was there to support his brothers. And in the process, he looks at Goliath, and something he keeps saying over and over again, he says, you know, who is this guy, an uncircumcised Philistine who taunts the armies of the living God? Well, he can't get away with that. Our God's much bigger than he is. And, and through all this process where David comes up and he says, well, I can take care of that Goliath. Now, something interesting is Saul says, who is this guy? Which causes me in, in the chapter before, David interacted with Saul, playing the harp for him and stuff. So what I'm thinking is, you know, Saul should have known who he was. But perhaps, again, the Bible is not a Western book. It's an Eastern book. And I'm not sure all the events, all the historical events are in chronological order. So it could be that David fought Goliath before he played the harp for, for Saul. I don't know. That's just an, an idea I've got, a theory that I've got. But uh, Goliath, by the way, is lying in verse 9, 1 Samuel 17, 9. He challenges one of you, pick out one of you to fight me. If I beat him, you guys will serve us. If he beats me, we will serve you. Well, David came down, met the challenge, killed Goliath, but the people of Philistia did not, the Philistines did not serve Israel. So that's a lie. Um, now, look at the character again of, of David. And in verse 26, again, I've already said this. That's all right. He says, uh, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He should taunt the armies of the living God. And Elab then, his oldest brother, says Elab's anger burned against David. Why have you come down here? What have you done with those sheep that you're supposed to take care of? I know your insolence and your wickedness of your heart. You've come down just to look and see what's going on. He was angry and he was all upset. He was acting immature, and he was acting selfish. And this is the man that Samuel first looked at and wanted to anoint as king. But the Lord intervened and said, no, there's somebody else. Now, um, another thing that's interesting here, and that's the way I'll close out this chapter. Well, I'm going to keep on going with this for a while. Anyway, none of of David's brothers served in David's army. Something to think about. 
Now, I've already said that Saul had probably been king 25 years or more by this point. And David went down. He told David, okay, go ahead and you fight him. He goes down and he gets five stones from a brook. Why did he get five? And I think it's because David was determined that he was going to defeat Goliath in battle. He threw one stone. The first one he, he hit killed Goliath. Well, what if he missed? Or what if he hadn't killed him? He only wounded him. He had another stone and then another one and another one. David had the, the preparation. I'm going to keep this going. I'm going to go as much as I can until I win victory. And that's how we have to be to be in our spiritual battles. I'm going to overcome this challenge. May not succeed the first time. I'm not giving up. I'm going to keep going. And so uh, that's what we're looking at here. And, and I think this is a great story of how God is bigger than Goliath. The people, the, the nation of the, the army of Saul and Saul were looking at Goliath and said, he's so much bigger than we are. David looked at him and said, saw how much smaller he was than God. So, Father in heaven, I pray that you'll help us to see whatever our problems are, the state of the world today, the issues we face, they're bigger than I am. They're bigger than we are, but you're bigger than they are. So help us to understand that and to work with you and love you and trust you in the situation we face individually and as the church and as the world today, as we, as we seek to shine light in the darkness, there's plenty of darkness around us. So help us walk in the light of your love and to share that light with the lost world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.